Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here are your hosts, John Joseph Adams and David Barr Kirtley. Hi, this is Dave. And this is John. And welcome to episode 90 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Our guest today is Melissa Marr, author of the best-selling Wicked Lovely series, which has been optioned for a film by Vince Vaughn. Her latest novel, The Arrivals, is about a group of strangers from throughout American history who find themselves transported to an alternate world that resembles the Wild West with monsters and magic. Then stick around after the interview as guest geek Rajan Khanna joins us to discuss weird Western movies. All right, so let's get to our interview. All right, so we're here with Melissa Marr. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Okay, and so your new book is called The Arrivals. So what's that about? Uh, The Arrivals is a story of killers from different time periods pulled into an alternate world where they have to deal with demons and political intrigue. It's a world in which the idea of death is not necessarily a permanent state of being. I'm kind of fixated with death. And so what I wondered is, how do we deal with the idea of never knowing whether or not death is permanent? In these characters' lives, after six days, they either wake up or they don't, and there's no predictable way to determine which it will be. The main characters are a brother and sister from the late 1800s American Wild West, um, Jack and Kitty, who have been there the longest, and Edgar, who is a trigger man from the Prohibition era, Melody, who's a 1950s housewife who likes to kill people, and Chloe, who's a modern-day girl who is our most recent arrival. They believe that they are working for the governor and trying to be a sort of vigilante force for justice. Um, But at the same time, they're also dealing with the fact, you know, of death being impermanent and having a, a nemesis who is basically destroying the community and the land and, you know, the mines and all of the sort of, you know, it's cultural imperialism. And um, and focusing on both the political and the personal in this kind of world. Uh, so you've described the book as a big departure from your previous ones. Uh, what would you say makes it so different? This is actually, honestly, it's the most fun I've ever had writing. I, I've obviously enjoyed my other books, but this was the book I wrote just for me. It's possibly the weirdest thing I've ever done. I'm dealing with coffin texts from the uh, Victorian era. I'm, you know, I'm pulling in Prohibition in the 50s and, and all of these eras that are just fun. And it's an alternate world and it's time space travel. And it's, it's lots of monsters and viscera hanging off the walls. And just, you know, it was a combination of cowboy movies and action movies and sci-fi love that just sort of said, I'm just going to do this, and either my editor will hate it or I'll get away with it. And Mm -hmm. it appears that I got away with it. And I mean, maybe just for people who haven't read your other books, you want to just say what your other kind of books are like uh, by Uh, way of comparison? Sure, sure. Um, I'm best known for the Wicked Lovely series, which is um, fairies in the modern world. And um, it's traditional fairies. It's coming out of my heritage, Scottish and Irish. And so it's a little bit more romantic, but also a little bit more dark. And it's, it's not an action series. It's dealing a lot more with relationships and traditional folklore and, and working very closely with the lore. Whereas this book is, you know, there's no real lore supporting this. I'm making it up as I go. Um, My other series is I have a, um, a new series, children's series that I just started with Kelly Armstrong called the Blackwell pages. And that's dealing with Um, the descendants of Norse gods in modern day America. And I had Grapeminder, which was a small town where the dead don't stay dead. So they're a lot more dealing with myth and folklore, whereas the arrivals is just gunslinging and monsters and action and not so much with the mythology. It's all made up. You mentioned the Victorian coffin text. Could you explain what that is? In Victorians was one of my eras in uh, graduate school. And in the Victorian era, they were very fascinated with Egyptology. And they'd have these parties in which there'd be a sarcophagus that you unwrap, and there's different things that come with it. And there are these things called coffin texts, which were little pieces of text that would be included. And there's one in particular that talks about not fearing death and facing death. 
And this particular text has this sort of tendency to seem like it's about, it's a, it's a recipe, it's a spell for opening a portal. And when I was reading it, it made a, a connection with physics for me with the idea of time, space, travel, and wormholes. And so I consulted with a physicist friend and um, went and understood uh, the idea of time, space, and wormholes a little bit more completely. And then basically put fantasy and science together. And suddenly there's a passage that instead of being a reference to what death is like, it's actually instructions for opening a hole that takes you to another place and time. Well, I mean, you say that uh, you didn't use a ton of folklore and stuff in this series, but you do in the back of the book have um, a, a sort of list of real world uh, antecedents for uh, some of the uh, elements in the book, like Garuda and Blood Zoiger and the Lindworm. Uh, like, where do those kinds of things come from? I guess when I say I don't use folklore, I mean, I don't use a whole body of, of lore. Like, for instance, Wicked Lovely is you know, specifically pulled out of a certain culture and a certain type of lore. Whereas with the arrivals, it's very piecemeal. Um, Lindworm is a type of dragon. And Bloodsucker is literally, the, the word means bloodsucker. And let's see what else is in there. Kynanthropes um, is basically dog shapeshifters. So it's basically pulled pulled through the idea of different types of lore and, and parallels to what we usually do, but I wanted to be clear that it wasn't those things. I, I find it very frustrating when someone calls something, for instance, a vampire, and it doesn't behave as a vampire should. So I wanted to make sure that I wasn't having people come in with the baggage associated with those words. So I pulled comparative words and comparative concepts in order to rebuild them the way I wanted them to work in my world instead of relying on the existing lore and the existing baggage that ties to specific words. In, in the dedication of the book, you also talk. About, you also thank your dad for the years of westerns, action movies, and guns. Uh, so, which westerns, action movies, and guns had the most influence on you? <laughs> well, um, my parents are card-carrying NRA members, and I grew up with guns. My father actually collects guns. I'm a very good shot, actually. I'm very proud of that. Um, being a girl growing up in rural Pennsylvania, um, there are gender issues, and I was determined that I was going to be as good as the boys. So um, I'm partial to a 357. I prefer a revolver often. Um, I don't like a 9mm usually. Um, I'm a scrawny-armed girl, so I can't deal with a 45. I'm not really good with rifles. I don't know. I mean, dad has a collection of guns and he'd just get them all out and we set up targets in the back and he's got a, an arm that pitches the clay pigeons and you just shoot and it's fun. Um, he and my mom did, um, they did league and that's what, you know, that was their, their date stuff. Hmm. And, um, and my husband is, uh, you know, he's a retired Marine. And so he was an expert, the highest level you can get in all of the options, you know, small arms, large arms. He did anti-tank artillery. So, um, you know, it was kind of a bonding thing for us, too. So big fan of guns. Um, I don't necessarily agree with the idea that we should not have any rules on them. But when you grow up country and there's much distance between you and the police and it takes very long time for that one officer to get to you, there's something kind of comforting about having a, a nice little artillery in your house. <laughs> so um, it was a social activity and it was, you know, it's just the way I was raised. Um, Westerns were all daddy liked to watch. We watched Westerns and, you know, give me some Clint Eastwood, some Charles Bronson, and I was a happy girl. So, you know, that was, that was our father-daughter bonding. And then my husband is a, you know, he's a, a huge comic geek. Um, and uh, to be honest, we've been uh, subscribers to Wired from the beginning. And anything tech, anything comic, anything action is, is his deal. Um, his degree was actually in film. So when we started dating, we went to every action movie, every superhero movie that, um, that came out. That was, our, that was our date stuff. Uh, so you mentioned like the setting was... Uh you know, wet, very Western, but uh, the heroes in the book are all come from different uh, time periods. Uh, how did you decide which time periods to draw the characters from? Well, I started with Jack and Kitty, again, with the Western. Um, and I love the Prohibition era. So Edgar was, was an obvious. And then I don't know what it is about the 50s. Um, I don't know, again, if it's a result of being a Marine wife. But I think the concept of femininity with the sort of 50s woman who's very put together, very polished, but has a rotten core and a twistedness in there is something I've always been really interested in. Um, 
when I became a marine wife, they had etiquette manuals <laughs> and they, they read straight out of the 50s. And it would be very confusing to me because people would call the house to speak to my husband and they had a certain number of, of statements and comments they would make to me. They'd inquire after the children. And, and it was all very, um, it was all very throwback. And so again, that was a logical choice for me. Melody was, and I needed a modern one. So uh, Chloe was obvious. And uh, Hector, my 80s guy was because when I was bartending, we used to have the carnies come into the bar all the time. And I loved the carnies. And so um, if I was building a carny as a character, I wanted it to be someone who would be based on the people that I had known. And so Hector became a logical choice. And then Francis, I just, you know, my, my in-laws actually live in a self-sustaining house in the mountains of Colorado off the grid where there's no utilities or, I mean, they've got a self-composting toilet. So the hippie character um, was pretty easy to build too. I, I can look at my in-laws for that. <laughs> so again, it was very much types of characters that I find intriguing as a person. I thought it was interesting. There's a part where, uh, you know, Chloe is from 2010 mm -hmm. and she's sort of, uh, maybe sort of starting to be interested in uh, Jack, who's sort of from the Old West. And she's sort of startled to realize that he has a very blasé attitude toward brothels. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just kind of curious, like, what do you think about those two attitudes toward brothels? Do you fall more on the Chloe side or more on the Jack side? Um, I actually fall more on the Jack side, actually. I understand um, that there are people that have issue with it. But it's a service like any other service. And I think that sometimes in our country, people are a little bit more uptight about sexuality than makes sense to me. And, you know, looking at that and the idea, I used to, I had a lot of friends that were dancers. I used to spend a lot of good time in strip clubs. And, you know, there are people that appreciate being able to have relations without having to worry about emotions. And if it's a service and people are responsible and not taking advantage of each other, I don't see the issue with it. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, that, that sort of fits. I mean, just from hearing you talk, it sounds like you've had a very colorful, interesting life. And that even goes back to your childhood, where you said that you were raised believing that fairies were real. I was. Um, I think colorful is a very polite way to put it. So thank you for that. <laughs> um, no, I, we'd hear those stories. And that was just the same facts as you hear in church and the same facts as you hear anywhere else in school. And, um, and there was proof, you know, my grandfather, we would leave out whiskey for the good neighbors and in the morning it was gone. And, you know, the cat wasn't drunk, the dog wasn't drunk. So clearly there were fairies. You know, it was later I realized that perhaps my grandfather might've been drinking it. But, um, at the time I thought this was evidence and, um, you know, there was never any reason not to believe there was a section of the woods you didn't go into because there was a banshee that hung out there. And, you know, we had a, a Victrola, a, like an old, um, record player thing that would periodically just start on its own. And my mother said that's because someone from the dead was trying to communicate with us. That was just how I grew up. And I think I was a teenager when I realized that some of it was perhaps also useful. I had gone out on a date and I had come home with um, missing curfew and my mother was waiting up and I explained to her that I would have come home sooner, but there was a vampire between me and the door. <laughs> and um, I had proof there was a mark on my throat where the vampire <laughs> tried to get me. And um, my mother looked at me very seriously and said, did you have your cross? And I did. I had a crucifix. And so I showed it to her and she said, OK. And I didn't get grounded. And so it was this sort of realization <laughs> that, you know, there's a power here in story. You know, in retrospect, I realized my mom was just being kind of cool. But, you know, at the time, it was also this moment of, you know, there's a choice to believe in these things and there's a choice to, you know, embrace it. And so it was fun. It's interesting, you know, I think, you know, Holly Black mm -hmm. and uh, we interviewed her a few years ago and she also was raised uh, to believe that fairies were real. Mm -hmm. And I asked her, well, when did you realize that they weren't? And she says, I don't think I've ever realized that. She says, I think that when you're raised with a particular worldview that sticks with you throughout your life at some level, no matter what, you know, no matter what happens later. Right. Oh, no, I'd agree with that completely. I mean, there's a point at which there are moments where you say, logically, this cannot be the case. But, you know, if I'm walking out late at night and I see a dark shape, there is absolutely nothing logical that is happening in my head. What's happening is I'm thinking, is this the wild hunt? Is this, mm -hmm. you know, is this a threat? And that sort of, you know, fear, flight, fight mechanism kicks in. 
And you can try and logic it away as much as you want, but there's still, and I think you have to believe in that to some degree in order to do the kind of immersive fantasy that I want to write, you know, and my children, my children were raised with that same belief. I think that's very important to have that sort of sense of wonder. I I don't have an issue believing in that and believing in the logic of science. I, I feel like I can make them coexist in my head. Well, yeah. And, and I mean, speaking of sort of scary shapes and so on, you've, you've said that you also have had uh, severe nightmares, uh, mm-hmm. even going back to childhood. Yes. And, and you uh, you had a teacher who said, well, you know, don't don't be alarmed. Maybe it's just Satan trying to get you. Oh, no, uh, they were very alarmed. They were <laughs> they were very alarmed by that. There, there was there was much conversation with the sisters. Uh, the parish priest came and talked to my parents. When I first started writing, I was in fifth or sixth grade, and Sister Elaine gave me a journal. And one of the very first things I wrote was a story about my nightmare that I had all the time in which this sort of um, wolf creature would come in and put his hands, fingernail to fingernail, they would go tap, 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 as they all touched together in the center of my chest, and then dig them in, rip me open, lift out my heart. And at the same time, I was also sitting on the chair next to the bed watching this. And he would look at me and hold my heart out to me. And it was just this very horrible, bloody nightmare that my parents say I had for as long as they can remember. Um, I would wake up screaming. And so um, I still have nightmares where I wake up screaming in cold sweats. And so now I use them and um, turn them into books and people give me money for it. Hmm. So I'm not complaining about them, Hmm. but I think there's a, a kind of, Believing in the supernatural and having those kind of nightmares, you know, if I don't write, I have violent nightmares. So I constantly write. I mean, can you think of any specific uh, elements of your books that were actually pulled straight out of a dream? There is a scene actually in the arrivals where they walk into an office and someone has been possessed by a demon that has sort of slashed and killed. And so there's blood and pieces hanging off the walls and and decorating everything. So that one was was from there. There's a scene in my first book in Wicked Lovely where someone is crawling across glass, well, they're not glass, they're ice shards that are coming up out of the floor. As the person is crawling, they keep coming up and embedding in the body. So um, both of those, um, yeah. Uh, so actually, just getting back to fairies for a minute, um, uh, as someone who grew up believing fairies were real, I'm curious, like when you may have discovered Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, you know, who wrote the Sherlock Holmes stories, uh, just because he actually uh, sort of famously also believed in fairies. I can't give you a year for that. <laughs> um, my my uncle's a Victorian's professor. So when I was a kid, we didn't have a bookstore where I lived. So he would bring home cardboard boxes and grocery bags of uh, teaching copies that they send to professors to adopt a book. So there were always stacks of classics around the house. And it's kind of embarrassing to admit this as an author, but I never paid attention to titles or author names. I just got in the box, got a book and read. So it'd be years later where I'd look at something that I'd be choosing to read and say, you know, this is familiar. I've read it before. Um, so I, I can't tell you the year or the experience for most authors, except for Stephen King. He was my one exception. When Salem's Lot came out, or well, when I got a hold of it, I was in middle school, and I thought it was the most brilliant thing I'd ever read in my life. But then uh, Neil Gaiman came along and oh, God, stole, you, stole you away from him. <laughs> I worship Neil. Um, aside from being a brilliant author, he's just such a good person. He was actually one of only three author events that I had been to prior to being published. And uh, when I saw him, it was me and like 10 other people sitting on the floor in a bookstore in Cary, North Carolina. Um, It was, you know, quite different from the way his events are now. And he was the most charming person. He was the best reader. And for someone that is totally intimidated by reading in public, I thought that was brilliant. And, uh, all these sorts of things that I had been raised believing in, he was turning into stories. So I was just like, you know, he's a God. Hmm. So. Someone recently, was this you? Someone recently I heard said Neil Gaiman's voice reading is like audio sex. Huh. And that could have been me. I kind yeah. of think that. <laughs> I had a, we had a, gosh, what was it? 2008, 2009. He had actually called me while I was driving. And embarrassingly, I don't think he knows this. We'll hope he doesn't hear this. I actually <laughs> had to pull over because I couldn't talk to him on the phone and drive <laughs> because I was like, dude, seriously, I just need to pull over and have a cigarette. Um, <laughs> the man's got a voice. 
Yeah, no one has ever said that about this podcast, strangely. <laughs> you know, it's it's a thing with some voices. I'm very, um, very interested in sensory input. And there are people that, that just have that voice. Um, James Marsters, who read one of my audiobooks, has another one of those voices. We did an event together and I was like, you know, let me just step aside and fan myself. Well, actually, actually uh, speaking of uh, sensory deprivation, uh, you're probably one of the only uh, writers that we've talked to who uses a snorkel as part of your writing process. <laughs> wow, you've done some research. <laughs> um, you know, I was really tired the first time I admitted that in public. And, <laughs> um, and it's one of those things that, you know, the world has a long memory. Um, yeah, so sometimes when I get stuck, I have a big bathtub. And you go in <laughs> under the water <laughs> and you close your eyes and it's a sensory deprivation situation, but you have to have the snorkel because there's, you know, the need for oxygen. And I have a, I have a saltwater pool for in the summer. It doesn't work so well in the winter, but I think that blocking everything out where you don't have input from any of your senses is a sort of meditative state that I think helps to reach past plot monies. You can you don't get stuck um, if you can just block everything out. And so I think, you know, the tub works or something physical I like to exercise or something where you have to concentrate on the details. I weave, um, I, I bake, um, something that enables me to, to knock out that part of me that has doubts and questions. And once I get away from that and all this, this noise, I fall into the story again and, and then I can get back to writing. So is there a particular brand of snorkel that you would uh, <laughs> recommend for writers? You know, it's actually one of my children's that they had. My son did a class um, in Southern California called Snorkeling with Sharks through, um, it's either the Scripps Aquarium or the Natural History Museum. And I just stole his. So, um, so, Wait, so I, that, I don't know. They have kids go snorkeling with sharks? You know, it sounds like the kind of thing that that's more dangerous than it really is. They're uh, I don't remember what the kind of shark is, but their mouth is is really like it, they can't bite you. They're little sharks. It sounds kind of, you know, dangerous, which is very appealing to um, young boys. <laughs> but really, they're not dangerous sharks. Uh, yeah, but you know, speaking of uh, blocking everything out, uh, I've heard that when you have a book option for a movie, that's what you should do. You should just try to forget about it and forget that it ever happened. But um, I've never really heard of authors who do do that. So, with that in mind, uh, what's the current status of the Wicked Lovely movie? <laughs> oh gosh. Um, well, I'm trying to say they, they give me sentences I'm allowed to say and sentences I'm not allowed to say. Um, what, what are, what's one of the sentences you're not allowed to say? Yeah, see, there's the problem. I, I tend to say those and then, you know, I know they're going to listen to this and then I'll get yelled at. So we're going to not say those. Um, I'm allowed to say that I am global is on board and I don't know if I'm allowed to say, but they're the people with the money. And generally what keeps a movie from being made is lack of money. So that's no longer an issue. Um, I like that. We were to the point of being very on track. I even have like a full color coffee table book of the characters and some of the CG stuff. I mean, it's gorgeous. And then it went into turnaround. But so then I Am Global came on board sometime around the turn of the new year. And so now it appears that we are actually going to have a movie. And I believe I'm allowed saying we are close to a new director. But I think that's all I'm allowed saying. So we have a new producer. We are going to have a movie. We are close to a director. Things are actually happening. And I think that covers my approved list. I've been begging them for more approved data before I talk to you because there's other things, but they kept saying no. So I emailed them again yesterday with a sort of, so well, and they're like, no. <laughs> well, so. it's, well, speaking of money, I mean, the, I, I heard that the uh, book was originally optioned by Vince Vaughn. And uh -huh. so I was just wondering if he just called you on the phone and he said, you're money, Melissa, you're so money. <laughs> Bond story is actually kind of embarrassing. He is still my producer. And I don't watch, I mean, I watch comic book movies like, you know, give me the Avengers, give me Thor, you know, those are my area. But I don't watch comedies and things. And so my agent called and said, Vince Vaughn wants to buy your book. And um, I'm not sure if I'm like cussing on here. So I'll just say my answer was, who the is Vince Vaughn? <laughs> and my agent said, type it in the computer, 
<laughs> and I looked him up and I was like, okay, so he's an actor. Why can't he go to a bookstore? I mean, do you have author copies? She's like, no, honey, he wants to buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> the purposes of, she's like, for making a movie. I'm like, oh, okay, sure. I mean, I guess. But the embarrassing part was then they've been really interactive and I've gone over all the drafts of the script. I've met with both of the prior directors. I've met with Vince. I've met with people about the effects. Um, so I keep going out there. And the first time I went out there, Vince comes in the room and all the other people knew what I said when they called me, but he didn't. <laughs> so they waited till he was in the room and said, so tell Vince what you said. And I was like, uh, no. <laughs> and, and then they tell him and he laughs and he said, you really did not I said, no. He's like, have you never seen? And he started listing. And I'm like, no, I've never seen any of your movies, but I can, if it'll make you feel better. <laughs> and it was, it was terribly embarrassing because he was so sweet and um, and so then I said I would go out and see one of his movies. Um, so wait, so have you seen Swingers? Do you have any idea what I'm talking about when I say no, you're so money? Oh, all right. No, <laughs> but I've I've read it in articles about him. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> but but no, I did go out and I saw uh, Mr. and Mrs. Smith. He's in that one, and things blow up. So that fit my criteria. Uh, you know, uh, so The Arrivals is your new book, but uh, you also have another new book out called Loki's Wolves, which you mentioned before. Uh, you want to just tell us a little bit about that? Loki's Wolves is the book I wrote for my now 14-year-old son um, back when he was 12. I had written Wicked Lovely for my now 19-year-old daughter. And when my son got to be age, he said he wanted a book for him that didn't involve any kissing. <laughs> so um, so Loki's Wolves is a book about 13-year-olds in South Dakota who discover that Ragnarok is coming. Um, in Norse mythology, that's the end of the world. One of the interesting things about Norse mythology is that the gods can die. And so I went with the concept of the gods have gone and done stupid things, as gods often do. So Ragnarok is coming, but the gods are already dead. So they need people to be their stand-ins for this final battle. And these kids who are descended from Norwegians who ended up laying down with gods at some point or another um, become the God stand-ins, the representatives, the champions for the gods in the end of the world. So it's set in South Dakota, where um, my husband's family is from, and they are Norwegian, um, complete with the extra A in the last name. Hmm. And it's the mythology, it's my children's heritage in the state that the family is from. The uh, the cover, it, it lists the authors as K.L. Armstrong and M.A. Marr. Why did you go with guys go with the initials? Because our names are so long. Okay, yeah. so, and we didn't want to have one name over top of the other. We wanted them on a row because we didn't want a sort of sense of, I don't know. You know, a lot of times when they do that, like on anthologies, there's like the lead author and then there's the other people. And we didn't want to have that. And between the two of us, they didn't fit properly. Mm -hmm. And the other issue is that, well, Kelly is a video game addict and I'm an action movie addict. We are technically girls, and um, we were concerned about um, our sons because she did the same thing. This was for her son as it was for my son. And so our sons are less inclined to pick up books by chicks. And so we decided that we would prefer to use our initials in part because of our gender, in part because of the size of our names. And the third reason is that my YA and her adult are darker. And we didn't want young readers to then read our other stuff mm. because there are things in there that I wouldn't feel comfortable with children that age coming across by accident. And so we thought the responsible thing to do on several different levels was to use the initials. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, you know, your publisher was nice enough to send us a copy of these books. I, I didn't get a chance to read Loki's Wolves, but I'm just looking at the cover and it shows a boy and a girl facing off against like... 10 or more gigantic killer wolves. Yes. And the boy has a shield. Like, okay, but the girl seems to be holding a stick. Uh, is it a magic stick or something? How do you <laughs> fight wolves with a stick? Or is, is she going to like toss it and have, have them go fetch it? Or <laughs> well, I, I don't know about the stick. Um, at, that point, at that point in the series, she is in fact weaponless. But um, obviously that's going to change. Um, but initially it's a case of we wanted to be sure that it was it was obvious that the book is by it's for both boys and girls. Um, we do multiple points of view, and I actually write I write one of the boys and um, and the girl, and Kelly writes the boy with the shield. That's Matt. Um, 
the, the idea is to represent that it is not just about a boy and his sidekicks, which is something that we've had a lot of positive feedback from moms, from teachers, and from, from young readers saying that it was exciting to read a book that was, you know, middle grade, but it wasn't just that the girl was there and it wasn't told in her voice. I mean, I love Harry Potter, but, you know, Hermione doesn't tell the story. Harry tells the story. And I think that there's something to be said about making sure that all the voices are heard. Uh, yeah, but so you wrote this book with uh, Kelly Armstrong and you guys had done these uh, Smart Chicks book tours. Uh, are you still doing those? We are not. Uh, the Smart Chicks book tour was supposed to be a single year. Um, it was to be a one shot because um, we had been told we couldn't do it. And I never respond well to that particular sentence. We, we had been told that group tours had to be from a single publisher. And Kelly and I had done one of those group tours and it's, it was very frustrating because I don't think readers say, oh, well, I'm only going to buy books by this publisher. So it was supposed to be a single year event. Um, it was author funded. It was author organized, um, mostly well organized, except that there was a little pushback because I forgot to include things like meals, which apparently <laughs> should be on the itinerary. And, um, but there were so many people that were interested and our turnout was unbelievable. So we decided to do it a second year. And then there were still so many cities and so many booksellers that were like, hey, you forgot us. So we ended up doing a third year and then we agreed not to do it again. Um, so we did three years. We did Canada and the U.S. And I think we ended up doing something like 30 cities between the three years. Um, it was wonderful. Yeah, I've really found doing multi, you know, doing events with multiple authors is better because then more people show up. Like I, I did one event where you know, for, for my writer's group in New York. And so of course, like three people came to see me, but then one member of the group was really popular and like 60 people came to see her, but then they all had to sit there and watch me before they got to see her. So well, it's, like, do it. it's like an opening it, act at a concert. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think it's great in several ways. I think it's great because yes, everyone's bringing in their readers. And I think that part's fun. And I think that readers are discovering new authors that way. But I think for us, the big motivation was that when you're doing these things, like you guys asked me earlier to describe one of my books and I fail at that so often. I'm just like, I don't know. It's, it's a book about some stuff that I like. And you know, I wrote it on some papers, <laughs> but I can tell you about Kelly's book, or I can tell you about like Rick Yancey's book, or I can tell you about books that I dig. So for us, it was very much about that. It was more fun and it, there's less feeling self-conscious and the other thing is traveling is just, you know, I go on these tours and I sit in a hotel room and do room service or I'm on a plane by myself and it's boring. So um, group tour was just more fun. So what are some uh, new uh, geeky books that you uh, dig? I absolutely loved Rick Yancey's uh, The Fifth Wave. I read it in one fell swoop. I was supposed to be revising and ended up not able to because I just wanted to read Rick's book. Um, it's more engaging than a lot of the YA that has been out previously, um, which I personally love. It's end of the world, alien invasion, you know, dealing with that in very, um, very poignant personal ways, as well as some guns, some violence, um, which I like. And uh, Rochelle Mead has an adult book um, that I think is out now called Game Board of the Gods which is a future world in which religion is banned. So it's sci-fi, but it's also pulling in religion and some mythology and that some of the religions are being kept down because they are actually valid. Um, and one particular mythological religion in particular that I'm fond of is a factor. So that one was a lot of fun. Kelly has a new book which may or may not, I have no sense of what, when things come out. She's got one called Omens, I think, which is the daughter of two infamous serial killers who doesn't know that she was adopted and then finds out that she is. And the family that's adopted her is very wealthy and she's very popular and very public and has to deal with this new notoriety. So that one was kind of interesting. Those are, I think, the ones off the top of my head. I've mostly been reading things like making baby food books because, you know, I have a six month old now, but those are my most recent, um, not baby related hmm. books. Um, all right, cool. So, uh, this we're almost at a time here. Do you want to just tell us, are you uh, working on anything right now? Uh, other than baby food? Do you have, uh, 
you know, uh, projects uh, off on the horizon or uh, stuff like that? I do, actually. Um, I am finishing a book that is very unlike everything that I have written. It is a book told in multiple points of view from a girl who is a survivor of a killer and the killer himself. And um, that should be out next year. I've been wanting to write a contemporary killer book for a number of years. And my YA publisher finally agreed. So it has a little bit of a paranormal element, but it is primarily a contemporary with a murderer. And uh, Kelly and I just finished the second book in the Blackwell trilogy, um, which is called Odin's Ravens. And that's out in May. And I'm leaving with Kelly to go to somewhere in Canada um, on the edge of the water and write uh, the third book actually on Monday. So uh, I'm trying to finish my killer book or at least put it in a place that I can take a break in order to go play with gods and um, monsters on Monday. Does the killer book have a title? Not that I'm allowed saying. Okay. Um, mm. they, they have one, but you know, I'm I technically, as I was telling you, I'm like, I'm not even really sure I'm supposed to be saying that because they told me <laughs> I was to talk about it online, but I'm not really typing this. I'm just talking to you. So we'll just assume <laughs> they aren't listening. <laughs> well, and you also have an anthology coming out this fall, right? Oh my gosh. Yes. I am so excited about my anthology. It's called Rags and Bones. And, um, it's a result of, um, my friend Tim Pratt and I were talking because he did, <laughs> he did something to do with Heart of Darkness and Dora the Explorer, which I thought was very fun and interesting. And so we ended up taking a sort of flip conversation into what if we took classic stories and made them sci-fi and made them modern. So it is a collection of stories by, um, Neil Gaiman, Rick Yancey's first ever short story, which has been optioned for film, uh, The Amazing Gene Wolf. Um, Kelly's in it, Cami Garcia, uh, Carrie Ryan, uh, Saladin Ahmed. Um, really, really interesting sci fi and fantasy takes on traditional short stories um, like Hawthorne, and um, Neil does a fairy tale, and I think Kelly does The Monkey's Paw. And so it's it's these classic stories with a sci-fi modern twist, and it was absolute joy to work on. So do you have plans to update your website at any point in the future? <laughs> yes, I, I, I do have those plans. I, I really do. Um, and I think about it regularly because my new book isn't even on there. But, you know, Harper made a website for my new YA, and then we made a website for Blackwell. So it hasn't been as pressing until the arrivals, which... I was determined I would get updated before the arrivals, but, you know, my son was born in December and um, his birth mother was a drug addict. And so we spent 40 days in the hospital going through withdrawal and he is still, he doesn't sleep more than two hours at a clip. Um, so pretty much when I'm not writing, I'm holding the baby because he's still suffering the effects of the drugs that were in his system. So that's been our... That has been my my general priority and focus in life these days is getting him okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, we certainly wish you guys all the best. Thank um, you. Do you have anything else you wanted to mention before I wrap things up here? It's just that I want to thank you guys so much for having me. My son and husband were just <laughs> so thrilled. I tell them about my work stuff and they're like, that's nice. But I tell them that it's you guys. And, you know, they were like, you know, the nods of approval, which um, I, I really appreciate. So thank you for the, thank you very much for that. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, thank you. Um, all right, so great. So I think we're going to wrap things up there. So we've been speaking with Melissa Marr. Her new books are The Arrivals and Loki's Wolves. So thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. And that was our interview. So thanks so much to Melissa Marr for joining us on the show. And as we mentioned for our panel today, we'll be discussing weird Western movies. And we're joined by a special guest geek, Rajan Khanna, who you may remember from our panel on Ray Bradbury back in episode 65. His weird western story Card Sharp appeared in John's anthology The Way of the Wizard, and his sequel story Second Hand will be appearing in John's upcoming weird west anthology Dead Man's Hand. He's also hard at work on a novel set in the same universe. So Raj, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Okay, and so when we initially planned this panel, we were planning to talk about weird westerns in books, comics, movies, everything but we just had way too much stuff to talk about. So that's why we're just limiting it to movies for today. 
And hopefully in the future, we'll be able to cover some of those other things. And so first, just in case anyone doesn't know, I just want to talk about what is a weird Western exactly. And I had always just thought that a weird Western was a Western story, you know, basically a story with cowboys and saloons and stuff mixed with some supernatural elements of fantasy, science fiction and or horror. But although actually uh, Wikipedia seems to think that a weird Western is a Western mixed with any other genre. So they have things that are like a Western plus uh, ninjas or something. It's a weird Western, even if there's no magic. Well, I agree with your definition of weird Western. I mean, that's my working definition of it. Yeah, I was surprised when I was when we were doing the research, some of the stuff that came up, because a lot of it didn't really seem like it was a weird Western. I guess it's kind of weird in the sense, like, you know, when you're saying like we're ninjas and ninjas in, in, in the Old West or whatever, like that's that's like kind of weird in the sense that it's like like this. It's got like this alternate history aspect to it. But yeah, no, I don't know. That doesn't necessarily feel like a weird Western. I, I feel like it's more of a feel sometimes. Like I'm willing to accept some of those East meets Western movies just because some of them have an almost surreal quality to them. And I think that is enough for me to accept it as a weird Western. But I'm always looking for something that has more supernatural elements to it. And for me, I, I noticed that in looking up, say, the Wikipedia uh, entry for weird Westerns, that they will lump in a lot of what I consider to be space Western. So like Firefly, a lot of people will bring up. To me, I love Firefly. It's one of my favorite shows ever. And I love space Westerns. And I think it's also a, a mix of genres that works really well. But I don't consider those weird Westerns for some reason. To me, they're, they're almost like a sister genre. But um, for me, weird Westerns predominantly have horror or fantasy elements. Although, you know, steampunk kind of crosses over into that and... You know, there are some movies I'm sure we'll be talking about that have science fictional elements. So I, I think this it's its not quite all science fictional elements, but specifically space elements, I suppose. You know, I totally agree. A space Western is a is a is an adjacent genre, not the same genre, just because it, it the so many of the motifs are different um, that it really feels like a separate thing. Although I, I would say it's probably uh, a sub sub genre of the weird Western because it, it's also kind of weird, you know, in the in that sense. But it's. um. It's uh, it is its own thing. And then just the other thing I want to bring up is how overt does the fantasy element have to be? Because it seems like like 90 percent of Westerns feature some like the American Indians are in touch with the spirit world or um, or, you know, somebody smokes a pipe and has a vision, goes on a vision quest or something like that. And if we'd include all of those as weird Westerns. Like, it seems like pretty much every Western is a weird mm -hmm. Western. So it seems to me it has to be more weird than than just those sort of really vague spiritual elements. It's amazing to me that in film and television, we still are at a place where there aren't that many films that embrace, you know, the supernatural and the Western together in to that level. I mean, we, we've seen a lot of steampunk elements come through. We've seen some horror elements, you know, in a certain couple of movies. Um, and I think there was Jonah Hex, which I didn't watch, and that apparently has some supernatural elements. But I'm surprised because I think in other, uh, you know, in, in books and comics and other places, there is this, it does seem to be more and more of these kinds of fantasy meets Western, weird Westerns coming out. And I, I would think this is great fodder for film. Well, I, I have a I have a theory about that. Why there aren't more of these things, and I think it's largely because if we look, I mean, as we discuss some of these other movies, I mean, we'll get into it in more detail. But like looking at the list of things that we had to consider, like so many of these are like almost universally reviled, like to a surprising extent. Like Wild Wild West, the 1999 uh, movie adaptation of the TV show. I mean. Like, Dave, you have here, it's like on Rotten Tomatoes, it had 20%. Like, 20%? Really? Like, people hate that movie. And, and some of the, and like, Jonah Hex has 12%. And so many of these other, like, I mean, Lone Ranger is 24%. So, I mean, it's like, people, like, aren't connecting with these things. And, like, you know, Cowboys and Aliens, that has 44%. And, like, that was a big box office flop. I don't know. It's just, like, I think, like, we're really waiting for the first really great movie to come out in this genre. Raj, I mean, I was uh, speaking of like being surprised. I was really surprised that there was no Cowboys versus Zombies movie. Exactly. I mean, like there must I, I think there must be one. But 
like none of the ones we watched had that, and I don't know of one. To me, westerns and zombies are are like a match made in heaven. Like it just fits in or with hell whole feel or <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, and you know, it's something that obviously has been explored in fiction quite a bit. But you know, we have, for example, there's I forget what that that movie was called with the the dead zombie Nazis. I mean, you have stuff like <laughs> yeah, that that can come out, and zombies have been plumbed through all kinds of uh, films. So I think, yeah, I mean, it, it seems like that would be a natural match. Listen up, Hollywood. You know, we have Dead in the West by Joe Lansdale. It's like a 40,000 word novel. It's perfect to adapt. It's cowboys versus undead. You know, just make it. I think part of the problem is that the weird westerns that everyone hates all have been adapted in that kind of Hollywood formula. Big blockbuster. Uh, it means lots of explosions, lots of cool special effects, but very little heart or storyline, I think. And, and what I think I'd like to see, especially with, like, say, a zombie movie, set in the West, would be a smaller film, you know, like have, have some kind of maybe director who came up on indie films do something like that. Whereas like Cowboys and Aliens, I liked the cowboy parts of that movie. And then when the Aliens came in, I was, I just kind of checked out. Mm. I find that most of the weird Western attempts, I'm actually more turned off than I am neutral on them. Like I, I Maybe it's because I expect more from them, but I, I don't really like... I, I didn't like Wild Wild West. Uh, I wouldn't see Jonah Hex just because I like the source material too much. To, and after I heard bad reports from it, I just figured it's not worth my time. But I really like... Just even from the past 20 years, there have been some amazing Westerns, straight Westerns that have come out. And so, like, to me, there's this huge discrepancy between, you know, these amazing non-weird Westerns that have been produced in, in the modern era you know, not even the Clint Eastwood spaghetti Western phase, but like recently, and, you know, this dearth of really good weird Westerns. I'd rather watch, you know, most of the non-weird Westerns, and I do watch some of them again and again. I mean, you're writing a whole novel set in that's a weird Western, so obviously you have an affinity for the subject matter. Just how did you get into Westerns, and what, uh, you know, what are some of your favorites? Yeah, I think, you know, it's funny, because, I mean, growing up, I was kind of into any kind of genre stuff, you know, so, so when I went to the science fiction and fantasy shelves, there used to be a Western shelf, like not too far away. And I never read them, but I was aware of the, the idea of the genre, but I think it was when I was in college really. And, you know, Unforgiven came out while I was in college. I think uh, Tombstone came out like a couple of years later, if not shorter than that. And it was seeing movies like that. And I think there was something about the, visceral nature of the movies because like when you're seeing the movies you hear the sounds that the horses make and the sounds that the pistols make and seeing them up close and that made it come alive for me in a way that i never had experienced before so like unforgiven and tombstone i think were two of the first uh westerns that i actually saw when they came out and and they kind of had a very huge impact on me i think that's what probably kicked off my adult love for for westerns um, and actually, you know, the, the weird part only came in later on when, you know, at the time I, I used to role play, or at least I, I wanted a career in writing for role playing games. And, uh, there was a role playing game called Castle Falkenstein. And it was, it was basically steampunk meets fantasy in Europe. But then they alluded to the fact that over in the colonies or in America, there were, you know, magicians that used six guns instead of, you know, spells. Hmm. And later on, a few years later, I think Deadlands came out, which was basically the same kind of thing, horror and fantasy tropes uh, thrown into a Western. And, you know, it, that blew my mind because all of a sudden I was like, oh, of course, like you can put these two together and they, they make perfect sense. And that was where I started thinking, well, screw the RPG stuff. I'm going to start writing stories like this. And so a lot of this stuff started forming in my head back then. Um, and, you know, I'm working on this novel now and I've written a couple of stories, but I have five other unfinished stories, weird westerns that are all kind of different takes on it because I think you can you can take it in so many different directions. But yeah, I, I, it started out for me with Unforgiven and uh, Tombstone. And also one of my, John, you alluded to Australian westerns before. One of my favorite mm -hmm. western movies is, is, uh, is it The Proposition? The Proposition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that movie to death. And, and that also, I think, had a huge impact on me to say that it's not just the American West where you can place some of these stories. And the Australian frontier was actually around the same time was quite similar mm -hmm. to, to what was going on here. 
Is Tombstone, is that the one with Val Kilmer? Is yes. Doc Holliday? Yes. Where the guy mm-hmm. says, you're so drunk, you're probably seeing double. And he says, well, I've got two guns, one for each of you. That's yeah. the one. Um, yeah, I mean, I really like, like, Unforgiven and, like, The Quick and the Dead. I really liked that when it came out. But I've never been a huge Western fan. I, I've never felt motivated to go back and watch any of the old Clint Eastwood movies or any of mm-hmm. those things. Um, how about John? What, how, where do you fall on the scale of Western fandom? Yeah, I've actually watched a ton of westerns. I went through a, a phase where I was uh, sort of catching up on the genre. Like uh, like Raj, I, I, I'm i pretty sure Tombstone was uh, one of the first, if not the very first, western that I ever saw. And then uh, and then I loved Unforgiven when that came out. And and then I sort of took a detour around westerns. I, you know, I went and I discovered Kurosawa and I was watching his samurai films. And then I heard about how um, basically, uh, I don't know if it's like literally, but like basically Sergio Leone like adapted, uh, the Kurosawa films and turned them into Westerns. And I found that idea fascinating. Cause so like I, I had watched the Kurosawa ones and then I was like, I went and, and, uh, saw the, the Western adaptations. I never actually did end up seeing the Magnificent Seven, which is kind of ridiculous since it's, uh, one of the legendary Westerns and it's based on, uh, Seven Samurai, which is like one of my favorite samurai movies. But, um, you know, so, I mean, I've watched a bunch of the Clint Eastwood Westerns, like, you know, uh, uh, Fistful of Dollars and all that. And, um, uh, I hadn't seen all of them though. So, I mean, I'm not, by no means an, uh, a, a Western expert, but, um, I definitely went through a period where I was like, uh, mainlining Westerns just to, like catching up on the genre. Mm-hmm. Well, it's interesting, the, the sort of, uh, synchronicity between, uh, Japanese samurai movies and Western movies mm-hmm. and how you can just, you know, you can just sort of change the sets and costumes and turn one into the other. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, two of the movies we watched are, uh, or at least I watched is Suriyaki Western Django and The Warrior's Way are these sort of Asian fusion uh, Western kinds of things. There's a term for uh, that Asian Western thing. I, I want to say it's, a, it's like a ramen Western, kind of playing off the spaghetti uh, Western thing, or, or it might uh, be something else. But, um, okay. but yeah, I, I, I should have looked that up before I said <laughs> that. But I, I think that's what they call that. And, and apparently, I remember looking this up before in that, you know, th- that's been going on since probably the 70s. And actually, the, the there's another one, too. The Good, the Bad, and the Weird I just watched is another example of that. What did you guys, uh, do you guys have anything to say about any of those movies? I, I just find them kind of really a delight to watch just from, from the, the kind of approach that they take where it's definitely, you know, they're taking as many Western, you know, elements as they can, but also the way that they film some of these. I, I've seen the, what is the Warrior's Way, is it? Or is it the yeah, Way of the Warrior? The Warrior's Way. The Warrior's Way. You know, like just it, that to me, the, the sets and the way that they filmed it. I mean, a lot of it's against the CGI backdrop, but you know, this, there's something very surreal about the way that movie comes across, you know, the, the circus performers and those, you know, incredibly color saturated backgrounds and, you know, just some of the ridiculous combat elements, which I also appreciate. I, I think, you know, again, it, they're not, there aren't really supernatural elements to it, but it, it takes it into the kind of category of the weird for me, just because it, the approach, um, you know, it almost honors the Western while taking it into entirely new directions. Yeah. The, the warrior's way. I mean, it's, uh, it, it, it's sort of like Zack Snyder's 300 if you have trouble, mm-hmm. picture, you know, um, visualizing what Raj is talking about with the super saturated colors and the backgrounds that kind of look more like a painting than a real life thing. And the sort of uh, particular use of slow-mo and the action scenes and, you know, close-ups of blood drops and spear points and stuff like that. Uh, the visual stuff I really liked in this movie. Uh, the premise basically is that there's a guy and he had trained in this uh, warrior cult in Asia and then he was going to wipe out their rival cult, but took mercy on this uh, the last remaining member of it, which was this baby girl. And he flees with her to uh, the American West, which puts him on the outs with his old um, clan. And then they all come after him and he has to kill everybody, basically. I mean, yeah, I think the plot was rather simplistic. And I, I mean, I, I, I think I enjoyed it more for the experience of taking it all in rather than as a you know, really great story. You know, you were talking about, you mentioned the good, the bad, and the weird, and uh, I didn't actually make it through the whole movie when preparing for this, and that was one I hadn't seen. But what I thought was interesting was that, you know, they have all these Western elements, they have the train, uh, train robbery, but then they have, um, you know, a group of people that approximate, I guess, Native Americans, which would, you know, it, normally in a Western, it, that role would be played by Native Americans, and this one, because it's set in the East, it's not. But 
Um, I found that an interesting approach just because, you know, it, it's almost a very literal way of, of approximating these, these kind of, uh, typical Western tropes. You should watch the end because the end is, is off the hook. It's, okay. it's, it's pretty crazy at the end. But yeah, the, the setting of this was fascinating to me. I, I wish I knew more of the actual history. I mean, it seems to be set uh, during World War II or maybe a little bit before. I mean, they talk about uh, Korea is occupied. And I don't know whether to, to what degree this approximates or resembles any actual period of history. I mean, there's a bouncy hunter who dresses like a traditional American cowboy. I don't know if anyone, you know, if that's historical. And there's this really interesting dynamic between, you know, some of the characters are Korean and some are Chinese and some are Japanese. And uh, I think a lot of that was just a little bit lost on me. But it's, it's, it was definitely a really fascinating, <laughs> fascinating setting. All right, cool. So, I mean, when I suggested we, we should do uh, Weird Westerns, I mean, obviously, Wild, the movie Wild Wild West was mm -hmm. one of the first things that a lot of people mentioned. And John, you actually said that this was not as bad as you remember it. I had never seen it before. It was certainly worse than I ever could have imagined. <laughs> so I'm just curious, how, in what way could this possibly have been not as bad as you remembered? Well, that's surprising just because you have several things ranked worse than that on your list. Uh, but uh, no, they were, there were a lot of movies here I didn't particularly yeah. like, I got to say. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I remembered seeing it when it came out, and uh, I think it was probably the first weird Western thing I'd ever seen. You know, I'd never uh, I'd never seen the original TV show it was based on. But um, I don't know. I mean, it's it just seemed fun to me. I, I don't know. It's like it's like a big action. You know, it's like a big summer blockbuster movie. And like, I thought like it did that fine. You know, I mean, it doesn't take itself seriously at all it had like a lot of the cool technology stuff in it like the gadgets and everything that they use and the, the you know the, the weird west elements to it like i i thought that was enjoyable and uh yeah i don't know i i, I just i just liked it i thought it was fun and Raj, what do you think of wild wild west i didn't really care for it like i didn't think it was it was an abysmal movie but i you know, I, I think part of what turned me off is what I was referring to before is like that kind of Hollywood blockbuster approach, which, you know, they usually have tremendous action sequences and things like that. But I don't feel like the plot is there. I don't feel like the characters are there. And, and it's really just a kind of backdrop for, for these huge action set pieces. And I read recently, I don't know if this is true, but um, if anyone's seen the, the Kevin Smith talking about when he was working on the Superman movie, yeah, that yeah. they wanted him to put in a giant spider. <laughs> and apparently the same producer produced Wild Wild West, so the, the theory is that he finally got his giant spider, but just in a different mm -hmm. movie. Um, I mean, stuff like that's cool. You know, like, I love those ideas, and I love seeing them come out in a movie, but the, the rest of the movie just didn't interest me. And I, I you know, I generally like, um, who's the guy who played Artemis? Uh Kevin Klein. Kevin Klein. Kevin Klein. I like him a lot. I think Will Smith is hit or miss for me most mm -hmm. of the time, but um, I, I didn't like Kevin Klein at all in this movie. Well, I didn't like Salma Hayek at all in this oh, movie. Yeah, she's without charisma. <laughs> well, I, I, don't, I don't even know. Like, I'm not saying I didn't like her as an actress. I'm just saying I didn't mm -hmm. like that character at all. It just seemed like her whole role was to be a hot chick who acts like mm -hmm. a toddler or something. Yeah, no, that's, she was a very weak character. Um, although I have to say there, there was probably, there was very little chance I was not going to like a movie that has a giant spider mech in it. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I mean, some of the, yeah, some of the technological stuff was kind of cool, but this movie, it just, it just felt to me like it was, you know, like Tim Pratt has that story about the uh, video store from the alternate dimension. Yeah. Like this movie felt to me like a movie from an alternate dimension in which the concept of political sensitivity was just never invented. <laughs> Because it's like so, I just, oh, so like, so like the scene where Will Smith is trying to like smooth talk the people out of lynching him. And like the, the villain is basically a guy in a wheelchair and there are about 25 jokes about how he doesn't have legs. It was just like, mm -hmm. some of the stuff was just like, who made this? And like, did they not have any, you know, any reservations about any of this stuff? It's just bizarre. I, I think I was mostly just disappointed because when I heard about that movie, I thought, Oh my God, this sounds really cool. You know, like the, this idea of these gadgets and, and things in the Wild West. And when I saw it, it just felt, it felt short of my expectations, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah. Cause this came out, uh, after, uh, Men in Black, which yeah. is so good. And it's the same director and it's Will Smith. I can't even imagine how disappointed I would have been if I had seen, you know, mm -hmm. if I'd been expecting this to be the next Men in Black and I'd gone to see it in the theater. I mean. I kind of wondered if it did have uh, that if that did have something to do with uh, the universal hatred of the movie is that people were really um, like looking forward to like the next big Will Smith movie and, and they just were disappointed and it wasn't what they were looking for. 
I, I felt the same way, though, about Cowboys and Aliens. You know, they announced that, and I'm like, oh, finally, you know, they're going to do a science fiction meets Western movie. And again, I got my hopes up because I just can't help myself. And then I saw that, and I I didn't think it was a horrible movie either, but I just walked out feeling disappointed, you know? Yeah, I was so excited for Cowboys and Aliens. It's got <laughs> Cowboys, it's got Aliens, it's got Daniel right. Craig, Harrison Ford, John Favreau directing. Like, how can you go wrong? Mm-hmm. And then everyone just said it was lousy, so I never saw it. But I, I was like, oh, you you guys, I'm sure it's fun. Mm-hmm. You know, it might not be the best movie ever. And then I watched it, and I'm like, oh, I mean, it wasn't, like Rush is saying, it's not terrible, but I was just so bored almost mm. for the whole thing. And I just, yeah, I just don't understand how you can go wrong with uh, with that talent and that, you know, all that promise. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I had fun with it. I actually liked I can't believe that I actually I'm liking movies more than you, Dave. Um, <laughs> this, this is like a bizarre, rare occurrence. And now I'm kind of I'm kind of wondering if I just have some weakness for weird Westerns and my anthology might actually suck because I don't actually <laughs> have any taste when it comes to weird Westerns or something. I, I just want to say, I mean, for a movie that bills itself as cowboys and aliens, I was just really disappointed by the aliens. But I will say that I think this is a Hollywood trend for me because lately, anytime they throw aliens into a movie, they're just like the most boring default aliens I've ever seen. I mean, sure, some are bigger, some are smaller, mm-hmm. some, you know, wear different kinds of clothes. But No, they don't wear clothes. Oh, mm-hmm. right. In this one, they don't wear clothes. No, like, none, of them, none of them wear clothes. That's my big thing with Hollywood aliens. They never, like, they can invent interstellar travel, but not clothes. <laughs> like, seriously, think about it. I mean, uh, signs... War of the Worlds. Oh, yeah. Like, I couldn't even say, like, when, when's the last time I saw some aliens in a blockbuster <laughs> movie wearing clothes? But, like, I love the Avengers. I thought that was great. But, you know, I, I can be critical of their aliens because they were just, you know, aliens to beat up and destroy. You know, they're, they're generic. There was nothing really unique about them. I mean, and that was, like, one of my favorite movies of last year. So I, I feel like Hollywood needs to up its game when it comes to aliens. This this should be it's like cowboys versus monsters, right? Like the aliens are not aliens at mm-hmm. all, really. I mean, you know, I mean, I like I like the premise of, uh, you know, some cowboys have to fight some aliens, but the aliens should, you know, they should have advanced technology. There should just be a couple of them. They're on a prospecting mission. Maybe mm-hmm. they're not, uh, you know, they're they're sort of the, the alien equivalent of just thugs and sort of low life criminals, and the humans have to prevail by overwhelming them with superior numbers and using clever tactics and stuff like that. But, like, why does super advanced aliens run around with no clothes on and fight with their claws? It just <laughs> makes no sense at all. Dave, they've evolved past the need for clothes. <laughs> <laughs> and I, th- I thought it was actually really interesting because Cowboys and Aliens has almost exactly the same premise as The Burrowers, right? Mm, mm-hmm. um, oh, yeah. But The Burrowers, it's actually interesting because... Um, Wild Wild West has almost exactly the same premise as Jonah Hex, too. I don't know if you guys mm. noticed that. And three of these movies involve the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad, uh, mm-hmm. which I want to get back to. But but, but Cowboys and Aliens and the Burrowers is almost exactly the same premise. But I found the Burrowers so much more effective. Yeah, well, I think I think one of the big differences there, too, is like the Burrowers takes itself very seriously. It's like it feels like an art house Western that happens to have a science fiction or fantasy element in it, whereas Cowboys and Aliens is obviously just, you know, summer blockbuster, completely over the top. And so, yeah, it's like they're, they're not even going to be able to really compare them in, in terms of the treatment. You know, well, I'm, I'm sure most people have never heard of the Brewers. So let's just right. talk about what it is. I mean, this is a um, it was a direct to DVD movie. I mean, it's it's not a high budget movie at all. Mm-hmm. And it's about. You know, it's uh, there's a frontier family. And a bunch of people go missing and a band of people get together and, and go looking for these people who have disappeared. And we know right from the start that there are some sort of subterranean monsters that are uh, grabbing people. It was really funny in the first scene, this family, you know, the, this town is under attack or the settlement is under attack. And the dad says, you know, get the kids and the women down in the root cellar and lock the door. And I'm like, don't you know that you're in a movie called The Burrowers? Don't go into the <laughs> cellar. <laughs> And it was the same. It was even the same actor who plays the Clancy preacher Brown. in both yeah, yeah, movies. I, that. I, I love Clancy Brown. I mean, he played the Kurgan in the Highlander yeah. movie. I mean, he's awesome. But he couldn't save Cowboys and Aliens. <laughs> Actually, though, that's that's worth mentioning. Though, like in the Burrowers too. Like, I mean, if people are still on the fence about checking it out, it's like uh, it has a great cast. It has like a bunch of like character actors you'll recognize. Like, if you watch a lot of the movies or television, like you'll recognize like lots of these people. Like, I I, I recognize most of the cast, and uh, and they'll do really well. Perf- really, they all deliver really good performances. So, 
Um, and it's funny because we were talking about how most people listening to this may not have heard of it. Um, I feel like even though I'm into the genre and and everything, I only heard about it because the director, J.T. Petty, was actually married to Sarah Langan, who's a horror writer that I know. And so it was like, I, I, it's just kind of surprising that this didn't hasn't made more waves just because I mean, because it's a, it's a good movie. But yeah, and then I want to mention how Jonah Hex and <laughs> uh, Wild Wild West have exactly the same plot, basically, you know, a... Um an unrepentant confederate general or something plans to build a doomsday machine to attack president grant who recruits the best agent he can to stop him and see raj you didn't even see jonah he or wait is that is that is that in the comics is that the same plot in the comics or did they <laughs> just rip that off from wild wild west for the movie i mean jonah hex has been has taken various forms i mean they're they're older i think 70s 80s uh comics uh the ones that i really enjoyed were came out in the 90s and were a Vertigo uh, miniseries. There are two, three Vertigo miniseries written by Joe Lansdale with art by Tim Truman. And I love Tim Truman, so I picked them up. And I didn't know who Joe Lansdale was back then, but those are like really kind of dark, supernatural stories. And as far as I know, they have nothing in common with that that movie at all. But I, I haven't been keeping up with the recent Jonah. There's like a, been a new series since then, but it sounds pretty crappy, so probably not. Uh, yeah, actually, I mean, we should just probably quickly mention who Joe Lanzill is, if people don't know. I mean, just be because he is very important to the genre. And I mean, in books and comics, uh, you know, so it's like sort of outside the purview of this particular discussion. But, you know, I mentioned he wrote this book called Dead in the West, which is one of the sort of classic uh, weird Westerns in, in prose form. So, uh, so you know, he's, he's one of the leading practitioners of this genre. So um, that's why we keep invoking his name. Mm hmm. But, I mean, Jonah Hex, like John mentioned, it's got 12% on Rotten Tomatoes. I mean, it's a really... Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, like, first of all, it's... Even just on really simple levels, it's terrible. Like, it's so dark, I couldn't even see what was going on half the time. Like, I couldn't understand what half the characters were saying half the time. There's all these scenes that are... You can't tell if they're flashbacks or dreams or mm. prophecies of the future. Or maybe I'm dreaming because I fell asleep during the movie, which is <laughs> entirely plausible. Uh, and so... Yeah, and just everything in it is cliche. I yeah, mean, yeah, it's pr it's pretty bad. It was definitely well. It, I would I would have said it was definitely my least favorite, except that uh, there was one other thing that I liked less for other reasons. But um, yeah, I didn't actually make it through Jonah Hex. It, it was it was too painful. Yeah, I'll say there but, were two things I liked. I'll, I'll say two good. Things, <laughs> I'll say two good things about it. One is he had a crossbow that fired sticks of dynamite. <laughs> That was that was pretty cool. And then at the, the very first scene was pretty good where he rides into town and he's killed four wanted bandits, you know, mm -hmm. that he wants to collect a reward for. And uh, he goes up to the sheriff and the sheriff uh, uh, sort of insinuates that they're all just going to kill Jonah Hex so they don't have to pay him the reward money. And he sees that there are five coffins because there are four for the criminals and then one mm -hmm. for him. He's like, you're going to need some more coffins. And he just <laughs> kills everybody. Yeah, that was pretty cool. Although, like, I, I noticed, like, you know, he had, like, a Gatling gun shot through the horse. <laughs> and, uh, and so I asked Kate, you know, I was like, wait, did he have that in the comics? And, and she said she didn't think so. I mean, so, Raj, you know, you know the comics better. Is that, like, a thing? Like, does Jonah Hex have a Gatling gun strapped to his horse in the comics? No. And, and I mean, <laughs> my, my image of Jonah Hex in the comics is that he's, well, the, one of the interesting things about him is that he's always been a... a he fought in the war, but he was on the Confederate side. He's always wearing this, the, the, the gray. And, uh, you know, he's got the scarred face. That's his other main defining characteristic. But he's kind of like, in the comics that I've read, um, and I haven't read them in quite a while, but, you know, he just kind of drifts into town and gets embroiled in these kind of schemes and things. And he's, he's one of those surly gunfighter types. So, you know, he, he's not your nice hero type, but, um, you know, the thing I liked about the, the comics, the, the Vertigo comics at least, was because they were heavily supernatural. And I, I guess there's no supernatural in the movie version. No, he can bring dead people back to life to talk to them. Oh, yeah. Well, see, that's something they just made up out of, out of yeah. air, I think. I, the comics, again, I haven't read them in a while, but it's like he's a normal guy who gets dropped into, uh, you know, mm. some stuff. I mean, the first one's called Two Gun Mojo, and the second one's called Riders of the Worm and such. Um, and I can't remember what the third one's called, but um, it didn't have Timothy Truman art, so I never really read it. But yeah, I, I seriously, literally could not bring myself to watch that, um, just hearing, and now I probably never will, hearing what you guys said about it. I'm actually curious about his name. Like, so in the comics, why is his name Hex? Like, I mean, is that, I mean that's just his, 
his the name he was born with. I mean, because uh, it kind of sounds like he would be a wizard or something, but it sounds like that's not the case. And I mean, in the movie, at least, like you know, he has the supernatural powers, so it kind of like yeah, makes I, sense. But I, as far as I know, that was never really part of his his uh, character. Although it, there was an interesting time in the eighties where you know Jonah Hex had, had his own series or had his own like part in a series, and uh, their big change to him at the time was to shoot him forward in time into a post-apocalyptic landscape, which mm-hmm. yeah, I was uh, only lasted that. for a little while. But, <laughs> uh, but see, that's, that's, I guess that's a supernatural thing, but it's still, you know, it sounds like this movie is mostly about high tech and action and things like that. And so still the supernatural just doesn't take over even from a plot perspective. You have, I mean, you guys, ha- I didn't watch any of these, but you guys had some of these old Quint Eastwood movies. Mm-hmm. Are these actually weird West? Did they actually have weird Westerns back then? Right. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, um, Raj can talk about Pale Rider. I didn't watch that one, but High Plains Drifter uh, does seem to be. I actually, I didn't make it to the end of that one either, just because that was actually my least favorite movie on the list. Although, curiously, on Rotten Tomatoes, it has 96%. Like, <laughs> I was like, what? I mean, admittedly, uh, the the plot of High Plains Drifter is actually pretty cool, but um, it sort of goes off the rails right at the start of the movie. Like, uh, Clint Eastwood's character rides into town, and he's, like, walking through town at some point, and this woman just, like, bumps into him and is, like, an asshole to him for, like, no reason. Like, aggressively is an asshole. And so he rapes her. And I'm like, <laughs> um, what? Like, wh- why did the hero of our movie just take a woman in- into a barn and rape her? Like, what the fuck? You know? And so, I mean, because I paid money to rent the movie, I was like, all right, well, <laughs> I kind of want to stop watching it now, but I guess uh, I'll see what happens. And, and so I, you know, I, I, I continue through it. And, uh, but I mean, like, you know, the plot is actually pretty interesting. Um, but, you know, uh, do you want to... Well, is it a weird Western? Is it a weird Western? Though? It, it, it does appear to be a weird Western. I mean, like I said, I didn't actually make it through the end. But um, what I think happens is Clint Eastwood's character was like the marshal in the town and like the town like stood by like while uh, people whipped him to death. And then so like he's actually uh, like a ghost or revenant or something of like coming back to haunt or this town or, or, or get vengeance on them or whatever, because, uh, because they stood by and let him get killed. Uh, cause it's, it's, it's like pretty clear, like, you know, uh, there's something happening there and it's not really, I think it's probably just explained at the end, but you know, I didn't actually make it all the way to the end. That's kind of cool just because I, I recently read the second Sandman Slim book by Richard Cadry. It's called kill the dead, but it has a, a loose plot that involves kind of zombie like creatures, but the main character calls them high plains drifters. Oh, okay, cool. Um, but yeah, you know, um, so, I mean, the, the general plot of it doesn't really have much of anything to do with the weird part. So it's not particularly relevant to the discussion, but I mean, it is, um, it is an interesting Western plot. It's like basically, uh, the town is under threat from this gang and they find the High Plains Drifter, you know, Clint Eastwood, and, uh, they see that he's like this amazing gunfighter. And so like they try to hire him, um, to protect them and he doesn't want anything to do with it. And so they're, they only are able to convince him by saying, well, look, we'll just give you whatever you want. And so basically they turn the town to, over to him and he's a complete asshole <laughs> about it. And so like, you know, he takes advantage of them completely. Like, you know, he takes away uh, everything that anybody who had anything had. Um, and and again, I think that's sort of feeding into the idea that he's just trying to take revenge on the town because, you know, they stood by and let him get killed. Uh, how about the Valley of Guanji? I didn't watch this one, but isn't it Cowboys vs. Dinosaurs or something like that? It is, yeah. Um, and it's it's one that I was a little dubious about whether or not it was actually a Western. I mean, because it's uh, it takes place a little bit later. Um, it's still within the Western time frame, uh, typical time frame, but um, it's like sort of right around the turn of the 20th century. It's about like a Wild West show, actually. So it's like sort of post-Western in a way because, uh, you know, people are doing Wild West shows rather than actually being out on the frontier. And um, but then like at some point it actually does turn into like, OK, yes, this is a Western because you have cowboys riding into into like dangerous territory where there happen to be dinosaurs and stuff. And uh, um, it's, it's, it's actually pretty good. There is some offensive stuff about it, which I, I think is like sort of par for the course with a lot of these western uh western movies and and it's sort of unfortunate i mean not it's not well and it's unfortunate that um it's it's very difficult to avoid that kind of thing and still like feel authentic um but it's always like a delicate balancing act like how do you put the stuff in there uh to be authentic but not be offensive so um but anyway so they 
they find out where the the secret valley is and they go and they find and there's dinosaurs and you know then there's cowboys roping dinosaurs and capturing them and bringing them back to the wild west show and all this stuff and then the dinosaurs kill everyone basically <laughs> so um it, it's fun though i mean it's a ray harryhausen uh special effects so you know it's that that classic stop motion type stuff it's surprisingly good for something from 1969 like i i didn't actually anticipate liking it because um i'm not a fan of that type of old movie too much but uh, Joe Lansdale had recommended it very highly, and so I was like, okay, I, I should watch it because he's saying it's a classic of the genre. So, well, I mean, you mentioned John the the movie is sort of being offensive, and I agree. It's it's this real issue because it's really hard to tell a Western story without issues of race being really mm -hmm. uh, foregrounded because that just was the facts of the period, uh, and and so it's just a very difficult subject that requires an extraordinary extraordinary degree of sensitivity. And these are just movies that are just not that well written. And so so it's just a, a fraught combination combining this sort of bad writing with mm -hmm. deep themes. Right. Um, and I, again, I thought the Burrowers did the best job out of any of these of handling mm -hmm. that, where uh, some of the characters are really racist, you know, and even the heroes are maybe not as enlightened as modern people would be, but they still seem like decent people and it doesn't dodge the issue but it deals with it in a you know intelligent responsible way in uh, rango actually which was uh which i thought was pretty good actually i mean it's, it's definitely one of the weirdest uh westerns on the list i mean it's uh because it's about like animals it's you know rango's a lizard and uh and there's this weird very weird western story that that is told in the story but uh, aside from it being pretty good, uh, actually, like, do uh, you remember the character um, that's like, he's like a crow, but he's like an Indian crow? Like, that that guy seemed like that was probably pretty racist. Uh, I mean, it, it seemed like I was watching it and I was like, I don't think that's okay. I'm not entirely sure, but it looks like it's not okay to me. But I mean, the movie was actually not too bad overall. I mean, it was, you know, like, like I said, it was very strange, but it had a good fun plot to it. And, uh, you know, I mean... I don't know. I mean, I didn't. I I had zero expectations for it, so I was just sort of pleasantly surprised. Yeah, no, I have this second on my list. I mean, I enjoy. I it made me laugh uh, out loud a couple <laughs> times, and that's more than I can say for a lot of these other movies. Mm -hmm. See, Raj, did you see Rango? I saw um, half of Rango, and I was watching it with somebody, and then I had to leave halfway through. So, I mean, I enjoyed it for what it was. I think there was a point halfway through where I just started my interest started flagging and it wasn't because there was anything particularly wrong with it i think maybe i just have a a limit for anthropomorphic funny <laughs> little cgi guys see i have no limit for anthropomorphic yeah. uh, animals oh right of course <laughs> um but no but i did kind of feel the same way i mean i guess you didn't see it but it's the kind of story where the character pretends to be something he's not right. and mm -hmm. then you know exactly what's going to happen for the whole rest of the story right and I guess that was my problem with almost all these movies is mm. that I knew exactly what was, you know, like 20 minutes in, I knew exactly what was going to happen. You know, every beat of the story for the entire rest of the movie and mm -hmm. rarely did it uh, deviate in any way from from what you would expect. You know, it's interesting because I feel like the Western is one of those genres where you can tell these really simple stories. And, you know, in some cases, like one of the most common plot lines in a, in a Western is the revenge tale, you know, like w what mm. um, John was talking about with the high plains drifter or, you know, the guy comes back or the, you know, like unforgiven or whatever it might be. And you know how that's going to end pretty much, you know, like it, it, maybe the guy lives, maybe the guy dies, but you're, you're kind of watching to see it play out. Mm. Um, and I, I find, I mean, when done well, I think you still, are, are drawn through, but when it's not done that well, you, you kind of lose interest because I guess you know exactly what's going to happen. I mean, it's, it's like I was watching Pale Rider this morning and I was thinking, wow, this plot structure is so simple. You know, it's like bad guys want these miners off the land because he wants the gold for himself, but they have a, a deed to the land. So, so the only way he can get it is if they leave. So they have, he has his men go through and shoot up people and not people, but like, they shoot a dog in the beginning and they try to scare them off. And uh, Clint Eastwood shows up as this preacher and, you know, helps them fight back and, you know, saves the day in the end. And I guess you could see that coming, but I don't know. It was still kind of interesting to watch. You know, especially when it's the dark gunslinger who's like really good. I just like seeing how they take people out and how, you know, how when is one guy against seven people? Like, how does he win in the end? Um, mm hmm 
Um, actually, speaking of uh, speaking of Clint Eastwood, uh, one of my problems uh, with Cowboys and Aliens was Harrison Ford. Like, I didn't really think he was particularly good in that role, and it just seemed like that should have been Clint Eastwood. Clint Eastwood would have <laughs> like, I mean, like he was playing Clint Eastwood is basically what it was, and I just I couldn't watch it and not be like, ah, I wish that was Clint Eastwood, you know. And it's like, I mean, he was fine, you know, but it's just like Clint Eastwood was it was born to play that role, <laughs> you know. Like, I mean, like he's played all these other westerns. It's like just put him in there. That's what he, that's that's the role. <laughs> um, but uh, which that also reminds me though, um, you know, I don't know if you guys actually watched or rewatched uh, Back to the Future Three or if you'd seen it back when it came on. But I mean, I just rewatched it and um, I actually really like that movie. Like that's actually surprisingly good for like a, a third movie in a trilogy. I mean, which you know, and obviously it's it's a, a time travel movie. But I mean, this one is totally a weird western. I mean, they they end up back in the old west and uh, there's all these time travel things that are happening and um, it's just, it's a lot of fun. And the reason I the reason I bring it up because of Clint Eastwood is because, uh, you know, Marty McFly, who's played by Michael J. Fox, you know, he goes back into time. He tells people that his name is Clint Eastwood. Right. And uh, there's a couple different uh, like Clint Eastwood references. One of my favorite things about it was uh, so at the end of the movie, you know, like there's this whole thing in the series where Marty uh, can't abide being called the chicken. Um, and then so uh, he gets uh, taunted into a duel, obviously. And and so uh, Marty takes a page out of the Clean Eastwood book uh, from Fistful of Dollars, which, uh, you know, he finds this metal plate and straps it to his chest under his poncho. And he and so when he goes into the gunfight, uh, he's able to survive the gunfight because of that. I mean, you know, this is a spoiler, but I mean, this movie is like a decade old or whatever, but. <laughs> But, you know, so that happens in Fistful of Dollars, and I just thought that was a really cool homage because, you know, his name's Clint Eastwood in the movie. And so, like, if you were actually, like, a Western aficionado, like, maybe you could have seen where that was going, but I just thought, like, they set it up really well. And so, like, you, because, like, you know, well, as far as you know. In Back to the Future 2, they show that scene, though. So if you watch Back they? to the Future oh. 2, yeah, because okay. um, Biff is watch old Biff in the evil version of uh, 1985, mm -hmm. is watching that movie. And, you know, and, and so the scene where the body armor comes down. So if oh, really? you just watched, yeah, so if you just watched Back to the Future 2, you would have that in your okay. mind still. Oh, that's awesome, though. Like, I, I didn't even realize that. Okay, cool. But, I mean, yeah, and, like, I just I just had a lot of fun with it. I mean, did you guys, uh, did you guys watch it, or? Well, I mean, the original Back to the Future was maybe my all-time favorite movie when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how many, I didn't watch Back to the Future 3 that many times, and I haven't seen it in a long time. But this actually the part in that movie that really sticks with me the most is there's a scene where uh, Doc is you know he's in the old west and he gets drunk and he starts telling people what the future is going to be like mm -hmm. and people say oh well you know with all this fancy technology are people still going to walk and he's like mm -hmm. oh yeah people still walk in fact they'll run they'll run for recreation for fun and one of the cowboys says running for fun what the hell kind of fun is that <laughs> and uh that just that just, that just sticks with me as a great science fictional moment of changing mm -hmm. societal I ideas and stuff but i, I was going to say i mean you know, I, I wonder, Raj, you're, you said you're, you know, you're working on a book and presumably you're doing a lot of research on the Old West and stuff. And do you not feel like movies just do the same things over and over again? I mean, like I mentioned that three of these movies use the uh, completion of the Transcontinental Railway and you just see the same, I don't know, this, like the same characters and the same situations come up over and over again. And I just have to believe that there's all sorts of stuff that happened in the old West. That's interesting. And that's not making it into the movies and people are just, it seems like all these filmmakers, they just go and watch a bunch of old Westerns and just take bits and pieces out of them and stick them together rather than researching the actual old West and finding interesting things that actually happened and using those and presenting something new and different. I agree with that. I mean, it's, it's one of those weird fine lines because one of the reasons, for example, I watch, Westerns is because I want some of those familiar tropes. You know, there are certain touch tones that I think you have to hit upon to kind of evoke certain things. You know, like, like we were just talking about the railroad in Back to the Future 3 and, you know, trains, I think for me, like I get excited every time I see a train in Western. I mean, not that it has to always be there, but it's one of those things that I will never get tired of trains or train robberies. You know, I, I still probably personally will never get tired as long as it's done well of that kind of you know, anti-hero, gunslinger, drifter character, um, as long as there's something more than just that, you know, to them. I mean, I like unique takes on it, but evoking that for me works. But I do think that, you know, a lot of this territory has been mined again and again. And like, you know, there there is a lot when you do some research. I mean, just it's difficult to say about that period because, you know, it was a, a period of American myth, you know, like a lot of the, if you look into certain personalities of the time, you know, 
the the public accounts are like he killed twenty seven men, and if you look at the historical accounts, they have evidence for maybe two, or, or mm-hmm. like some of the you know guys known as the stone cold killers. You know, some people maintain that they never killed a person in their life, but <laughs> the, you know their reputation was that they were this deadly person. But, you know, there is some weird stories from that time and some interesting stuff. Or like what I was thinking about before, we were talking about Australian Westerns. I mean, it's not, to me, it's a a little element of the weird, but Ned Kelly was um, Mm. probably the most famous Australian outlaw. And there was a big gunfight that happened. And, and, you know, it's sort of maybe inspired, I don't know if it had any inspiration effect on Clint Eastwood's uh, little vest or, or plating or whatever, oh, yeah. but he, he had actual armor. Like they, they mm-hmm. made helmets and chest plates out of metal and that helped protect them from bullets. I mean, they were eventually, I think, I don't know if all of them were killed, but Ned was killed, but that's just kind of, you know, it's not something you would associate with the West or that time period. In uh, John's anthology armor, there's a story by David Levine, which is about the Ned Kelly gang, except they make actual steampunk armor in oh, that cool. version. But I, I did want to mention, though, that when you were talking about how the West, you know, was is really exaggerated, um, that, yeah, that's my understanding, is that the Wild West was really not that violent, and that what we think of as the Wild West with all the, you know, gunfights at noon and stuff was an invention of dime novels that came along later. And actually, I mean, a lot of people have been saying in the wake of, uh, like, the school shootings and stuff we've had recently, people have been saying that there was actually more gun control in the Wild West than there is now. Because the reason that the shootout at the OK Corral happened was that you were supposed to turn your guns into the sheriff whenever you arrived in a new town. And these, this gang refused to do that. And that's what led to their shootout with the, with the authorities. One thing that actually surprised me, although a lot of these elements, these historical elements were common in, in some of the things we were watching, I was actually surprised that there was nothing that referenced the OK Corral or, you know, nothing references Wild Bill Hickok or Calamity Jane or anything in Deadwood. Um, so, so I mean, there, I mean, there were a lot of things that were sort of common, iconic uh, Western things that weren't mined for this. So I think that they're, you know, I, not to say that filmmakers weren't being lazy and just borrowing things from movies, like you were saying, but I mean, there was a lot of stuff that they could have mined that they didn't. Although I, I will say, and speaking of Deadwood, um, although, I mean, it's, it's just a straight Western. It's not a weird Western by any means. I remember vividly when that was about to come on, uh, uh, when it was about to debut on television. It was on HBO. And the tagline for the show was, I'm pretty sure, Deadwood, it's a hell of a place to make a living. And I was like, oh, my God, it's a weird Western. I'm so excited. <laughs> you know, because it's like the tagline made it sound like. It was going to be so like, like, and I mean, the, if you watch the trailer, it's like, well, is Al, Al Swearingen the devil or something? Like, what is it? Like, <laughs> I, I, I mean, it's like, it, it just, like, I, I formed this whole narrative in my head. And, I, and, and like, even though I ended up loving the show, I was like, I was like a little bit disappointed that it wasn't that thing that I'd imagined. Well, that's why I think it's a great, you know, just the era is great for a horror mashup because, you know, two of the most famous towns of the era, Deadwood and Tombstone. I mean, like, yeah. that, those are their <laughs> names. But one thing I wanted to say, John, and I guess we'll get into this if we ever talk about books and things, is that, you know, they don't even need to come up with their own stuff. There's there's plenty of books out there that they could adapt. There's plenty of Lansdale mm-hmm. stuff they could just sure. pick up and make a movie out of, and it would touch on all this new stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but I guess we'll see. Oh, and the territory by Emma Bull. Like, I mean, like, I mean, yeah. that's speaking of Tombstone, you know, the movie Tombstone, it's like, it's basically like the, the movie Tombstone, but with magic. <laughs> right. And it's like, oh, that book is so awesome. Like, I would love to see that adapted. Well, I, I want to talk about the Lone Ranger. Sure, um, yeah, yeah. Actually, I don't really, I don't really want to talk about it. <laughs> but <laughs> I feel like bullet. I, I feel like I want to get something because I, yeah, because I'm the one who went and saw it out of the three of us. Uh, yeah. Because John told me it was a weird western, so I hold John 100 percent responsible. <laughs> I blame Charlie Jane. It was her, uh, Charlie Jane Anders on io9. Her review made it clear that it was a weird western, and I was like, oh, well, it just came out. We should probably cover it. But thank you for taking the bullet for us, Dave. Uh, I mean, I, I guess it kind of is. I mean, well, yeah, I mean, he comes back to life and there's like a magic horse and evil carnivorous rabbits and stuff. But all, all the um, weird Western elements are kind of a uh, comic relief and stuff. So it doesn't really feel like a weird Western. It just kind of feels mm-hmm. like a Western. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously, the the big thing that everyone was sort of pissed off about was Johnny Depp playing Tonto rather than getting an American Indian actor to mm-hmm. play the role. And yeah, I mean, ugh, the characters are so like the the Lone Ranger is so boring, and Tonto is just weird and annoying. And that's really, I mean, the beginning of the movie is actually pretty good, and the end there's this like crazy 
uh, train chase, which is reasonably entertaining. The middle kind of drags. I honestly fell asleep uh, during the Tonto <laughs> backstory stuff, so I'm a little vague on that stuff. But um, yeah, they. I'm I'm totally sick of Johnny Depp's uh, Jack Sparrow mm-hmm. routine. And again, it's just like like everything in this movie you've seen before. You know, it's 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 again, it's sort of just sort of a a remix of cliches. Except for the carnivorous, I, I heard actually that the, originally the carnivorous rabbits were supposed to be central to the plot, mm. and now they're not. They're not. <laughs> uh, that would have. I mean, if you're gonna, yeah, but if you're gonna do it, make make it about some carnivorous rabbits or something. You know, do something with it. Were they jackalopes or were they just weirdly <laughs> carnivorous rabbits? No, it's it's just it's just totally bizarre. There, there, there's sort of this running gag throughout the movie where animals will do something weird, and Tonto will say, "Oh, nature is out of balance." And um, and so there's a part where they're just sitting around a campfire and um, Tonto throws a piece of meat to these these rabbits have sort of gathered around and he throws a piece of meat to them. And when he does, they all kind of open their mouths, revealing these canine incisor teeth thing. And then I'll just start fighting each other for this piece of meat. And Tonto says, yeah, nature is out of balance. And mm. and that's the that's the only time these rabbits appear in the entire movie. Uh, <laughs> So I, I mentioned, Dave, that you took the bullet for us. It's a shame that you didn't have a metal plate under your poncho. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I have a question, actually, which, I mean, might not be important, but the Lone Ranger used to always use silver bullets, right? I don't know anything about the Lone Ranger. There is, like, in the movie, uh, Tonto gives the Lone Ranger a silver bullet that he says he's going to need to use to kill the main bad guy, who he claims is a um, Wendigo. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um. But then it's not clear if that's actually the case or not by the end. Mm -hmm. See, that's just begging. I mean, when I grew up, I think it was like he always used silver bullets, which is probably not a good metal for firing bullets from. But, you know, again, that just begs for like the Lone Ranger versus werewolves or something. I mean, it's it's basically there. Why does he shoot silver bullets? Well, that's the only way he can kill werewolves or weird coyotes or whatever, you know. Um, But I guess I'm not a Hollywood (laughs) writer, so. Yeah. I actually want to say it was kind of funny because, you know, Johnny Depp, I guess, has said he's like one sixty fourth American Indian or something like that, Mm -hmm. uh, which was supposed to, I guess, placate people a little bit. Uh, But uh, that just kind of makes me think of a funny story because I don't know if I've told you about how my dad told me I was um, uh, a descendant of Wild Bill Hickok. Mm. I don't know if I've ever told you that. Yeah, I know. But like, you can never really know for sure if my dad telling me stuff like that is accurate or not. (laughs) Because uh, my dad also told me growing up that I was part Cherokee, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and uh, and like I would tell this to people and they would scoff because I'm you know, like like super white, like blonde hair, blue eyes, etc. And I would say, well, no, obviously it would be a really small, it would be like one sixty fourth <laughs> Cherokee or something. <laughs> but that's what my dad always told me, you know. And then so I'd believed this my entire life that I was part Cherokee, right? And then we went and visited my great grandmother, uh, and it was her husband my great-grandfather who was had supposedly told my dad that he was part Cherokee right and so we so somehow this just came up in the conversation and she says like Harry part Cherokee that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard and so uh, so we're like to my dad like well wait how like he told you that though and, and my dad's like yeah and we're like well what were the circumstances he's like well let me let me think and he like he's like I'm trying to remember and and so the story kind of comes out that my great-grandfather had been like doing a lot of gardening or something over the summer and so he was really really tan and my dad had said, Grandpa, why is your skin so dark? And, my, and he had said, oh, it's because I'm part Cherokee, just as a joke, right? <laughs> and my dad didn't get that it was a joke. And so he had believed that his entire life, that he was part Cherokee. And then he told me, and I had believed that my entire life until I was like 30, uh, all based on this dumb offhand joke that my great-grandfather made. Hmm. So just got to be careful with that stuff. Wow. I wonder if that happened to Johnny Depp. <laughs> um actually you know uh, i heard something like really awful about his about the costume of tonto like apparently johnny depp like designed it all himself but he based it on like some painting that he saw from like the era but it was a painting by a white man you know who like didn't know what he was doing and um and also and there was something about the bird like because he has like a dead bird on his head or whatever right that he tries to feed throughout the movie or something yes right? uh, sadly um, is. yeah and so and it's like it, it's just like it's like almost everything about like his costume that he came up with. It was all like misconstrued shit. Like that just doesn't make any sense. And so it's just it's a it's a real shame, you know that. You know, well, they didn't I mean, bring the, that in. the the one sort of mitigating thing is that Tonto is portrayed as like a severely mentally ill Indian. Uh-huh. Like so, all the stuff he like all the bird on his head and all that stuff. It's not like that's the culture. It's just like he's crazy and he does all this weird stuff. Mm-hmm. 
so you know <laughs> uh, that's not much of a saving grace it's it's actually just <laughs> insulting other people it's insulting the mentally ill instead i guess but yeah i right. i just want to say one thing about dave's wild bill hickok thing which because it's the second thing that reminds me of sandman slim because in the main character who goes by stark is actually apparently a descendant of wild bill hickok in that book as well oh. so hmm. so yeah, maybe yeah. dave you're you're gonna be a kick-ass urban hmm. fantasy wizard type <laughs> <laughs> yep any 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 year now i'll, <laughs> I'll get into yeah. that so uh just you know, we we basically covered all the movies that we that we actually watched. But um, you know, I was mentioning Joe Lansdale earlier, and because he's this uh, iconic figure in the genre, I asked him if he had any recommendations. And you know, I, I watched Valley of Guanji because of him. And um, he also like the highest recommendation he had for film was this movie called Curse of the Undead. And I tried looking it up, and like I mean, it's just like it seemed to be like completely unavailable. Like there was no way to rent it online. Um, I I looked to see if like if you could buy it or whatever, and it was like it was only available on DVD, but like for ninety dollars, you know. So um, I don't know if if anyone's seen this and you and you want to uh, and you want to chime in on on what you thought of it, like let us know. And or you could make a contribution to us via <laughs> our website, a ninety dollar contribution, and then we yes. could buy it and watch it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we'll we'll take the bullet and watch it for you. Um, <laughs> But, uh, yeah, he also recommended two other movies that I didn't get to watch, uh, but Billy the Kid meets Dracula and Jesse James, Jesse James's daughter meets Frankenstein. So, uh, I mean, they kind of <laughs> sound like they're not entirely serious either, but, um, Curse of the Undead actually sounded like it was, uh, a pretty serious treatment of it, and, and I was very curious about it, but, um, alas, I could not watch it. There was one movie that I, I just found out about this morning that wasn't on our list, um, and it's dubious because it's a sci fi channel movie. But mm -hmm. there was one in 2009 called High Plains Invaders. Uh, mm. Apparently, it's in the Wild West, and there were alien bugs that came and, you know, invade the town. And the, the, the notable thing about this, from what I've been able to tell, is that James Marsters, who played Spike on Buffy and Angel, mm -hmm. uh, is the main character in that. Oh, okay. So. If I had known that, I, I might have checked that out, because I actually did stumble across that one. It's just that I dismissed it because it looked like... You know, Sci-Fi Channel original movie. Crap. It's, it, it right. wasn't. A, it wasn't available anywhere. I, oh, I tried. Okay. I tried to get it. Okay. All right. Cool. So I think we should probably start wrapping this up. So I think the bottom line is go watch the Brewers. Yes. And uh, maybe a couple of these other things we mentioned. And if you're a big fan of weird Western comics and books, stay tuned. Uh, we'll we're planning to talk about those, as we said, at some future date. You should also go check out Rajan Khanna's short stories. Card Sharp in Way of the Wizard, and uh, the upcoming story Second Hand in John's upcoming Weird West anthology, Dead Man's Hand. And I, I just add that uh, Dead Man's Hand is supposed to come out in May of 2014, so that's when you can look for that. And um, also, if you guys are interested in... Um, if you guys are interested in, in the Weird West and you want to read some of the stuff that maybe we're going to talk about, I would say look for, um, look for Six Guns Snow White by Catherine M. Valente and Dead Man's Road by Joe Lansdale, which is a collection that includes his novel Dead in the West, and read The Sixth Gun. And uh, I wanted to shout, give a shout out to those specifically because uh, the publicists were all uh, kind enough to send us copies of that stuff, but then we didn't end up getting to talk about it. So, uh, But we do want to. So um, if you guys want to read it ahead of time, uh, you can hear us uh, chat about it uh, in the future. All right, cool. So we're going to wrap things up there. So Raj, thanks for joining us. Thank you guys for having me again. And thanks again to Melissa Marr for being our guest today. Big thanks as well to everyone who's given us five stars on iTunes, including KCSX and Mr. Hot Dog Boy. And a special thank you to everyone who's contributed money to help keep the show going. So big thanks to Frank Swanson for becoming subscriber number 53, Julian Corpse for becoming subscriber number 54, Colin Weidig for becoming subscriber number 55, and R. Chris Four for becoming subscriber number 56. To see a list of all our subscribers, visit our website at geeksguideshow.com and click on subscribe. So I've got a pretty busy schedule this month, so we're going to plan to release our next podcast on August 10th. So thanks everyone for listening, and we'll see you in August. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your hosts, visit johnjosephadams.com or davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by Slipgate 9 Entertainment. If you enjoyed this program, 
Tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.